Good morning, everyone. I call this hearing to order and a quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We're working in a hybrid format today, but I'm going to dispense with the rigmarole in the interest of time here. If anyone has any issues, just use the raise hand function. We'll figure out what you need. And just a reminder to our online guests to make sure that you pause a couple of seconds before you start speaking so we capture everything uh, on the feed. So without objection, members will be recognized in order of seniority for questioning witnesses. That makes it easier for me to make sure that all members participating have an opportunity to be recognized. Uh, any questions before we begin here? Uh, with that, I want to welcome all members and witnesses to today's Oversight Investigation Subcommittee hearing, ensuring independence and building trust, considering reforms to whistleblower protection at VA. During today's first panel, we will hear from the Department of Veterans Affairs and the U.S. Office of Special Counsel. For our second panel, we will hear from representatives of three advocacy groups, including Whistleblowers of America, Government Accountability Project, and Project on Government Oversight. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, today's hearing uh, is a, an important one. It's ensuring independence and building trust, considering reforms to whistleblower protections at VA. Now, whistleblowers play an essential role in safeguarding the federal government against waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement. Department employees often witness problems that put the health, safety, and well-being of veterans at risk. In the best of circumstances, when serious problems are pointed out by VA staff, corrective action is taken. Too often, though, the messenger is the one who's punished. It was information from whistleblowers in 2014 that revealed to Congress and the public that thousands of veterans suffered because VA officials had buried data showing lengthy wait times for health care. This became a major scandal for VA and also led to important and long overdue reforms. Whistleblowers like these must be protected from retaliation. This is not only the law, it's also the right thing to do. Three years ago, this subcommittee held a series of hearings examining VA's Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection, or OAWP. The subcommittee had serious concerns about its performance, effectiveness, and conduct, and for good reason. A 2019 Office of Inspector General report found that the Whistleblower Office was a failing organization. We heard that the office not only failed to fulfill its responsibilities mandated by law, but frequently worked against its core mission of protecting whistleblowers. In 2019, we heard testimony from three employees who suffered retaliation after blowing the whistle, including the loss of their positions at VA. In fact, one of the whistleblowers, VA clinical psychologist Minu Agavelli from Baltimore, Maryland, received a termination notice just days after our subcommittee's hearing was announced. Based on the investigative record, there was little question as to whether these individuals were legitimate whistleblowers. The question was whether VA would take action. What happened during the past three years with these three hearing witnesses is illustrative. Ms. Gavelli, her case is still winding through the bureaucracy. The same is true for Dr. Catherine Mitchell, a VA physician from Arizona, who was instrumental in exposing the wait time scandal. Frustratingly, Dr. Mitchell initially was able to return to work and then faced further retaliation. The third individual is Mr. Jeff Detbarn. He's an x-ray technician from Iowa City. In the case of Mr. Detbarn, he was able to return to his duties in February of this year, but his case took more than four years to conclude. So let me underscore this point. For these three individuals, the wait for justice is measured in years. I do believe that things have recently improved. I know that Secretary McDonough and Ex Assistant Secretary Donaghy have clearly and publicly articulated that VA whistleblowers should and will receive the respect that they deserve. This message is welcome, and it does make a difference. Leadership statements in support of whistleblowers help change a culture and serve as a deterrent to those who would punish someone for having the courage to take a stand when they see wrongdoing. However, VA must do more to earn the trust of whistleblowers and restore faith among department employees who may wish to step forward. We need to see permanent changes to policies and procedures, including through improved laws. First, VA must take disciplinary action against those who retaliate. After VA's Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection investigates whistleblower disclosures, it can make recommendations for disciplinary action against the perpetrator. However, the majority of these recommended actions are not being implemented. According to VA's own figures, in 2021, OAWP made 15 recommendations for disciplinary action against employees who retaliated. Of those 15 recommendations, two-thirds were not implemented. And of the five that were acted upon, only one was fully implemented. This is just completely unacceptable. Oddly, OAWP's working environment, uh, work investigating retaliation is also 
duplicative. There is an independent federal agency that also conducts investigations into whistleblower retaliation called the Office of Special Counsel. And in fact, the Office of Special Counsel has the ability under law to require enforcement of disciplinary action. VA must also do better making whistleblowers whole after they suffer retaliation. When VA concludes that a whistleblower suffered retaliation, typically the employee and the department's lawyers negotiate a signed agreement to reinstate the employee's position and reimburse lost wages. However, as I pointed out, these settlement agreements typically take months or even years to conclude. Meanwhile, the, missile, the whistleblower may face financial hardship and psychological strain. Why did he stick with it for so many years? He told us in 2019 that Jeff Detbarn simply wanted to return to his job. He said, quote, taking care of patients and ensuring the best possible care for veterans is why I am here. Now, Ranking Member Mann and I have reached consensus on bipartisan legislation that would strengthen the independence and mission of VA's whistleblower office. It would end the VA whistleblower office's investigative authorities, which is duplicative of the independent office of special counsel. Uh, and OAWP also currently lacks the ability to enforce these recommendations. So I look forward to hearing from our VA witnesses and from the office of special counsel. We're also joined by three advocacy groups, all of whom testified three years ago, uh, and their comments are really important to this subcommittee. So this concludes my opening statement. I'll now recognize uh, the ranking member, Tracy Mann, for five minutes for his opening comments. Great. Uh, th th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, I believe we need to address VA's late submission. Last night, VA sent us another batch of OAWP recommendations. We had no trouble reviewing these prior to the hearing, but I take issue with the way VA is doing business. There's no reason these could not have been cleared and provided to the subcommittee earlier than last night. The chairman and I are in lockstop when it comes to what we want to achieve out of this subcommittee, an improved VA that provides the best possible services and outcomes to veterans and their families. Late submissions and unwillingness to engage sooner delays Congress work, but it does not stop us. I invite VA to join us in our efforts to improve the department. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by thanking you, uh, Chairman Pappas, uh, your staff for working with me and my staff on this bipartisan discussion draft. This discussion draft incorporates Democrat priorities and Republican provisions for my bill, H.R. 6638, to improve the VA Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection, or OAWP. This bill would give OAWP a position of counsel to advise the office on legal matters. <coughs> It would require OAWP to track settlement negotiations and agreements between VA employees and the department. It would refocus OAWP on providing resources and training to VA employees on whistleblower rights. And most importantly, it would remove OAWP's investigative authority. As I've stated before in our previous hearings on this topic, it is clear to me that the office has not been performing at the level Congress or the Secretary should expect. In 2021, OAWP made 57 disciplinary recommendations. Of those, three were mitigated, 13 were modified, and 29 were not implemented. In other words, 45 of 57, or 80 percent, of all the disciplinary recommendations OAWP made were changed or simply ignored. This is a sustained reality of the office despite different leaders and administrations. As I said before, either the OAWP recommendations were sound, but their poor reputation inside the agency leads VA officials to disregard the recommendations, or OAWP's investigations were flawed and their recommendations should not have been made. I do not see the value of the office's investigations and recommendations if they are flawed or dismissed out of hand. Instead, our bipartisan draft would direct OAWP to refer whistleblowers to the Office of Special Counsel, or OSC. OSC already has the authority to receive, manage, and investigate allegations of retaliation, and the office has an impressive reputation for impartiality and rigor. OSC also has the authority to protect whistleblowers from further retaliation by staying any actions the department proposes against a whistleblower while their allegations are being investigated. The Assistant Secretary's written testimony claims this discussion draft would, quote, hinder VA's ability to improve accountability and to protect whistleblowers, end quote. Oh, wait, Mr. Donahue, I respectfully disagree with you. Ms. Donahue, I especially disagree with you. OAWP and VA have regularly failed to improve accountability and protect whistleblowers. Just last week, we learned about an OAWP investigation into a senior leader. The investigation took place from September 2020 to the January of 2021. Yet, the report was allegedly delayed for more than a year. OAWP finally finished the report on February 23, 2022, and the report found that the senior official did retaliate against a whistleblower. 
OAWP recommended discipline for the senior leader and VA manage, management agreed discipline was warranted, but it was not carried out. Why? Because the individual retired the same week the report was finalized. Did OAWP at least protect the whistleblower? No. The whistleblower and other staff who were involved left VA because of the senior leader's retaliatory behavior. Ms. Donahue, OAWP and VA delivered no accountability and no protection for the whistleblower. This case and others like it exemplifies why I do not believe OAWP can succeed under its current structure. No matter how many lawyers, how much money, how many attempts at restructuring, or how many new authorities Congress may give the office, the Assistant Secretary will still report to the Secretary. The office will never be truly independent. The Fox is guarding the hen house and it's time for a change. I want to thank the Office of Special Counsel, the Government Accountability Project, and Project on Government Oversight, and Whistleblowers of America for your valuable feedback and input in this legislation. I'm very pleased my priorities from AWP Bill H.R. 6638 were incorporated into the consensus draft. I'm grateful for this bipartisan work of this, for the bipartisan work of this subcommittee, and look forward to introducing this bill with the Chairman in the coming days. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Mann. I'll now recognize full committee chair Mark Takano for five minutes for opening comments. Thank you, Chairman Pappas, Ranking Member Mann, and the rest of the subcommittee for holding today's hearing on improving whistleblower protection at the Department of Veterans Affairs. I cannot stress enough the importance of whistleblowers for improving how the federal government operates and serves the American people. VA employees have firsthand knowledge of the inner workings of the department. VA is entrusted with providing the highest quality service possible to our nation's veterans, and the department must listen when its employees have the courage to speak up about wrongdoing. Further, VA must create a culture where employees are not discouraged or stifled by the threat of retaliation, such as the loss of their jobs or workplace harassment for simply speaking up. In the past several years, whistleblowers have helped root out waste, fraud and abuse that directly affected the ability of veterans to access timely and high quality care. So I commend this subcommittee in its oversight work during the past three years on this issue. The subcommittee has examined the effectiveness of VA in protecting whistleblowers and disciplining those who retaliate. When retaliation occurs, VA must, must make whole the whistleblower who is unfairly punished for speaking truth to power. I participated in the subcommittee's hearings three years ago where we heard about the struggles and suffering whistleblowers endured after speaking out. These hearings revealed how the department mistreated whistleblowers even after it confirmed findings of retaliation. Witnesses reported a merry-go-round of frustration. We heard from several individuals who gave firsthand accounts of long waits for justice despite representing stark examples of whistleblower retaliation. Three years ago, I said that I did not have confidence in the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection and could not in good conscience recommend that a whistleblower seek its protection. Back then, we had a VA secretary who did not respect whistleblowers and actively worked against those who reported wrongdoing. For example, one whistleblower, VA clinical psychologist uh, Agevli, received her termination notice just before she was set to appear before the committee. That was appalling. Let me be clear. I believe things have improved. I recognize that VA has addressed past concerns raised by the VA Inspector General, President Biden, Secretary McDonough, and Secretary, Assistant Secretary Donaghy have voiced strong support for real cultural change within the department concerning whistleblowers. And I think they are aiming in the right direction. However, more must be done. The plight of whistleblowers is still a major concern to me. I mentioned Ms. Agevli. Uh, three years ago, she was still awaiting justice. She still has not been allowed to continue her work at VA. And there is a second major problem. I was surprised to learn earlier this year that few who retaliate against whistleblower uh, face, uh, the, the, there are very few who retaliate um, against whistleblowers, face any, dis uh, they face any disciplinary action by the department. Chairman Pappas mentioned this point and it's worth repeating. 
only one third of those that the VA whistleblower office itself determined had retaliated against a whistleblower received any sort of punishment. This is a total of only five individuals. Clearly, whistleblowers need and deserve more support and protection. The words of senior leaders at the department are not enough. They must be backed up with the force of law, and I support Chairman Pappas and Ranking Member Mann's bipartisan legislation, their bill would strengthen the independence and mission of OAWP and would take, another, would take other critical steps as well. Trust is hard to build and easy to lose, and I believe that VA has a lot of trust building to do. So uh, again, I thank you, Chairman Pappas, and Ranking Member Mann, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Chairman Takano. We will have two panels for today's hearing. And with us today for panel one, virtually, we have two government witnesses. From the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have Ms. Mary Ann Donaghy, Assistant Secretary for Accountability and Whistleblower Protection at the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection. She's accompanied by Ms. Catherine Matrano, Principal Deputy General Counsel and Acting General Counsel, Office of General Counsel. We are also joined by Ms. Elizabeth McMurray, Chief of Retaliation and, and Disclosure Unit at the United States Office of Special Counsel. I'll remind our witnesses to pause for a couple seconds before speaking so that the recording can pick up all of your words um, and your written statement in full will be included in today's hearing without objection. So with that, I now recognize Ms. Donaghy for five minutes who will give the VA testimony. Ms. Donaghy. It appears you're muted, Ms. Donaghy, if, if you're able to unmute. Thank you. Um, that works. Sorry about that. Um, Chairman Pappas, Ranking Member Mann, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Almost one year into my position, the opportunity to serve veterans through the important work of whistleblower protection and accountability at the VA continues to be an honor of a lifetime. I've worked hard this last year to engage with this committee and its staff on this topic, and I continue to be grateful for the insight and support that I've been provided by the conversations. Thank you. In 2017, Congress gave VA innovative tools new to the federal government when it established OAWP. They included an additional option for whistleblowers to raise concerns and also important non-investigative tools for VA to improve the culture of accountability and whistleblower protection as an agency. Establishing an office that is designed to enhance accountability and the protection of whistleblowers in an organization as complex and large as the VA requires time, resilience, and much hard work. Unfortunately, the challenges experienced by OAWP during its initial years, culminating in a comprehensive OIG report issued in October 2019, not only failed to advance its establishment, but created distrust with stakeholders that is already made, has made an already challenging task that much harder and longer to accomplish. VA therefore recognizes and respects the concerns that are reflected in the proposed legislation. However, these last two years, OAWP has demonstrated an ability to transcend those initial challenges and operationalize the important tools that, that were provided by Congress, recognizing that vigilant, constant improvement remains the hallmark for long-term success. During this past year, I have come to even more deeply understand and appreciate the efforts of OAWP staff in closing OIG recommendations. That work put into place the building blocks for an effective office and provided a springboard for OAWP's future. We remain hard at work. Within the last year, for example, OAWP has undertaken the following. We've established an investigative attorney division. These attorneys report through OAWP and are not part of the VA's Office of General Counsel, addressing any appearance of conflict with OGC's involvement in investigations and their conclusions. We've improved our reports of investigation to make them more succinct for VA managers and to highlight the legal protections afforded whistleblowers. OAWP is on the cusp of instituting an alternative, alternative dispute resolution or ADR program offering yet another important option to whistleblowers for relief. We've created a whistleblower navigated, navigator position, position soon to be posted, dedicated to providing whistleblowers and other stakeholders with information to help navigate options for whistleblowers as well as other resources. Working with OGC, 
OAWP has established a tracking mechanism for VA settlement agreements that involve whistleblower retaliation. And we are leading a comprehensive review within VA to continue to identify the reasons that managers may not take our recommendations and to continue to make relevant improvements. OAWP has increased in-person training to supplement mandatory training. As well, I have just begun a series of visits to VA facilities across the nation to listen to VA employee concerns and to communicate the importance of the important OAWP mission. And OAWP is just beginning to operationalize the non-investigative functions that Congress provided us in its statute, including reviews that enable advice to the Secretary on accountability and also conducting analyses to identify trends and provide proactive information to address concerns. Simply put, the OAWP of 2019 is not the same office as the OAWP of 2022. And driven by a dedicated staff, OAWP will continue to improve. Respectful of time, I defer to my written statement on further specifics within the bill, but I do appreciate the opportunity to give the summary statement. I again thank you for your support and the support of your staff. As can be seen by our ongoing projects, our work is informed by your input and oversight. Thank you for the time, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Ms. Donaghy. I'll now recognize Ms. Elizabeth McMurray uh, from the Office of Special Counsel for five minutes. Good morning, Chair Puppis, Ranking Member Mann, esteemed members of the subcommittee and fellow panelists. Thank you for including the U.S. Office of Special Counsel in today's legislative hearing. I'm honored to be here representing OSC again in front of the subcommittee to speak with you about the importance of whistleblowers and how OSC works to protect them. Additionally, OSC appreciates the opportunity to discuss the proposed legislation concerning whistleblowers at the Department of Veterans Affairs. OSC maintains its steadfast support of our veterans and promoting a positive work environment for VA employees. Ensuring that whistleblowers are properly supported and that their voices are heard allows the VA to best protect the health and safety of our veterans. Throughout his tenure, Special Counsel Kerner has prioritized our work with the VA. In fact, the Secretary of the VA was the first department head with whom he met upon taking office. Since then, Special Counsel Kerner has met individually with each VA secretary during his term, including, most recently, with Secretary McDonough. He has also met with Assistant Secretary Marianne Donaghy, as well as with her predecessor, Dr. Tamara Banzanto, and with VA Inspector General Michael Missel. In each of these meetings, the special counsel emphasized the need for VA leaders to send a clear message from the top about the value of whistleblowers to their organization and asked them to affirm their unwavering commitment to prevent and address whistleblower retaliation. They all did so. By way of background, to accomplish our mission of supporting whistleblowers, OSC works on several fronts. First, we provide whistleblowers with a safe channel to make disclosures of wrongdoing and ensure that those disclosures are properly addressed. Our statutory disclosure process shines a light on any such wrongdoing at federal agencies and ensures accountability to the American people with a unique and significant role for the whistleblower throughout. Second, we provide an avenue for whistleblowers to seek redress for retaliation and other prohibited personnel practices. With these cases, OSC not only has investigative authority, but also enforcement authority, as we can pursue corrective action and disciplinary action before the Merit Systems Protection Board. This enforcement authority, coupled with our independence, gives whistleblowers confidence in our processes and allows us to obtain positive outcomes for our stakeholders. Finally, OSC has a robust training program whereby we train managers and employees at various agencies on employee rights and the merit system principles. Through each of these mechanisms, we endeavor to help agencies like the VA promote a culture that supports whistleblowers, encourages disclosures of wrongdoing, and prevents retaliation before it begins. With the VA specifically, maintaining a good working relationship through open lines of communication has been critical to working towards our shared goal of promoting better government through transparency and accountability. During the special counsel's tenure, OSC has provided numerous trainings to the VA and OAWP. In addition, OSC continues to hold monthly meetings with representatives from VA's Office of General Counsel, OAWP, and the VA Office of Medical Inspector, and also 
quarterly meetings now with senior leaders in OGC. During these meetings, we discuss individual cases that merit high-level attention, as well as general issues that impact our work across the board. We remain deeply committed to helping the VA, this committee, and this subcommittee provide the best service that it can to veterans by ensuring that any reported wrongdoing receives appropriate consideration. To that end, the special counsel has ensured that OSC dedicates a front office staff member to work as a liaison between the agency and Congress, facilitating OSC support for your important work. We thank you for seeking OSC's input and subject matter expertise on this and previous draft legislation. In particular, we appreciate the opportunity to review the proposed legislation within the broader context of whistleblower protection laws that apply to employees across the federal government to help ensure that any potential legislative changes will result in maximum protection for VA whistleblowers. And we appreciate the thoughtful consideration this subcommittee has given to our previous comments. Finally, we look forward to continuing to work with you and your staff on this important issue. As we've previously stated, VA employees are among the greatest patriots in federal service as they've devoted their professional lives to serving veterans and many are veterans themselves. It is imperative that they feel supported in doing their jobs without fear of reprisal. Although there is work yet to be done, OSC employees work hard every day to bring us closer to making that goal a reality. Thank you again for including OSC in this hearing and I look forward to answering any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you very much, Ms. McMurray, for your testimony and to our first panel for joining us. Uh, we will now turn to the questions, and I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. It appears we'll have votes in the 1045 to 11 o'clock range uh, that get called, so hopefully we can get through this first panel here um, before the break. Um, so Assistant Secretary Donaghy and Ms. Matrano, um, obviously great to see you again. I appreciate uh, your openness and the conversations that we've had um, over the last few years. And look, the legislation that is before us today, I think is written to address what I see as clear shortfalls in the policies and procedures of the department. So I was taken a little bit aback by your written testimony, and I, I don't doubt um, the good work that you're doing, your commitment to whistleblowers and to getting it right. Um, but the department stated that it opposed each and every provision, big or small, within the legislation. So I just wanna ask a, an initial question, is there nothing in the proposed legislation, Assistant Secretary Donaghy, that you support? Uh, thank you, Chair Pappas. Um, certainly, there is um, um, there are provisions that were supported. The um, it, it's just that we do not believe the statutory authority is needed for making some of the important um, suggestions that have been made, uh, including, for example, the Office of General Counsel the increased um, support for, for whistleblowers are two provisions, for example. So, um, and I should say, uh, generally, um, I remain personally committed, my office is committed, and the support of the VA um, secretary and leadership to the holistic, continuous improvement of whistleblower protection, um, as is reflected in the bill, is also a very important theme that is fully supported um, by me and my office um, and the VA. So, I mean, it sounds like you're supportive, but not supportive of the approach, um, supportive of certain provisions, like for instance, the accountability and transparency provisions in the bill, which I think are really important to spell out into law. Is that not something that you support? Absolutely support um, transparency. Um, I've committed that to this committee. Um, I hope that, um, that I follow, fallen, followed through with that. Um, again, I am always supportive of continuous improvement um, and suggestions to make that happen. Okay. Um, but even more, um, the transparency to me has given given uh, this office and me personally excellent suggestions that um, I see it as my job to execute on and um, believe that we've done that. So look, you have my commitment. We want to continue to, to hear from you and we'll take any technical assistance that you want to provide uh, on this legislative effort. Um, I noticed that the department's testimony didn't include any of its own recommendations for proposals on how to improve whistleblower, how whistleblower cases are handled. So I was a little bit surprised by that, but we are open to receiving that information uh, if and when you want to submit it to our subcommittee. I'm just wondering if you have any specific ideas for improvements, and maybe we could take the area that has been a real sticking point for me, which is the timeliness of settlement agreements. Um, anything that can be done there, any suggestions that you might have? 
Uh, thanks, Chair Puppis. From an OAWP perspective, our policy is um, understandably uh, to defer to um, the choice of the whistleblower in terms of what forum they choose to um, they choose to pursue their claims. Uh, and so, if a whistleblower chooses to pursue it through litigation or administrative relief um, via the settlement agreement. Um, OAWP does not get involved in that process, again, in deference to both that process as well as the choice of the whistleblower. So look, I talked about years that some of these folks have waited. Um, Dr. Catherine Mitchell, who appeared before the subcommittee uh, three years ago, stated that uh, in reaching a, a settlement, uh, the long delays, quote, devalue whistleblowers um, and that um, the office tries to avoid institutional accountability uh, for the retaliation. So, look, our legislation is really needed, I think, to help restore this sense of accountability and trust among whistleblowers, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that in the second panel. But Assistant Secretary Donaghy, I want to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of your office continuing to investigate whistleblower retaliation cases. Of course, both OAWP and OSC can investigate retaliation. We've talked about this. Um, I see this as duplicative. You testify that your office's ability to investigate claims of retaliation gives, whistleblower an op gives whistleblowers just another option. But doesn't the Office of Special Counsel have stronger authority to enforce its recommendations through the MSPB? And to put it simply, doesn't OAWP lack the teeth to enforce findings of recommendations? Uh, respectfully, um, Chairman Pappas, I, I actually think that the uh, tools provided by Congress holistically within OAWP uh, complement OSC's very important uh, enforcement authority. Um, I have always personally believed that more choice for persons aggrieved um, is the best option. Uh, that is always balanced, of course, by whistleblowers maybe needing more support to choose a different option. But I've also always believed that the organizations charged with protecting them um, should be the ones to mitigate, um, you know, that kind of confusion. Uh, and so I believe that the additional choice of a whistleblower to come to OAWP is a very important one, and one that, um, as we continue to continuously improve within OAWP, as well as the other tools within its statute will prove to be a very important aspect of whistleblower protection. Well, we'll get into this a little bit more because I think it is a, an additional door, but I don't think the track record uh, is there. Um, and so um, we'll continue to discuss this. My time's up, so why don't I turn it over to Ranking Member Mann for five minutes of questions. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for each of our witnesses and, and then a quick statement. Um, first question um, for you, Assistant Secretary uh, Donahue. In March of this year, VA provided the committee a batch of 12 OAWP recommendations that were not implemented by VA. Late last night, VA provided another seven recommendations. I will first say that the batch notification style that you've adopted does not meet the requirements of the law. Second, included in these are four cases similar to the one I spoke about in my opening statement. At one facility, OAWP recommended the range of discipline from 12-day suspension to removal for three supervisors who engaged in whistleblower retaliation. However, VA officials disagreed and the individuals received no disciplinary action. At another facility, OAWP recommended the range of discipline from demotion to removal for an, for an individual who retaliated against and harassed an employee. VA officials believe the file lacks certain testimony and evidence. The individual received no disciplinary action. At another facility, OAWP recommended the range of discipline from 12-day suspension to removal for an individual found to have retaliated against an employee for disclosing an inappropriate relationship. The director of the facility decided the findings were unsubstantiated. The individual received no disciplinary action. Again, at the same facility, the senior leader who overruled the previous recommendation and stopped disciplinary action was found to have had an inappropriate relationship with the subordinate. The leader resigned in lieu of disciplinary action. My question is, do you believe these are examples of VA holding senior leaders accountable? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Mann. Um, first of all, I can't speak to any specific case. However, um, the holistic review of these matters, um, to me, provide VA with the opportunity to holistically look at where problems may be and where they're not. And so that that kind of um, that bulk reporting is exactly um, the ability to try to get to the bottom of 
what went wrong and what might not have gone wrong. Um, as I've mentioned, um, since I've since my nomination, um, VA and my office recognizes uh, the important tool uh, that this provides uh, to be able to kind of dig down and understand uh, accountability. Um, and we've undertaken a process. Um, it's been not only quite active, um, but we've also at the same time been implementing improvements uh, to identify um, the reasons why management may not take recommendations. And as um, I'm sure is not surprising within a complex agency, um, there are multifaceted um, multifaceted. I, I'm um, going to have to ask. You, I'm going to have to. Ask, I don't mean to cut you. I'm going to have to ask another question as well. But no, th th thank you. Um, my second question is for um, you, Miss McMurray. Millions of veterans rely on the VA for their care and benefits. Holding VA senior leaders and employees accountable is what improves the services veterans receive on a daily basis. Would you explain? Would you please explain OSC's process for making recommendations to VA to hold individuals accountable? Thank you for the question. Yes, I'd be happy to explain our uh, process. Uh, essentially, what you're asking us about is discipline. And uh, we do have enforcement authority. So our process would be to conduct an investigation into the uh, alleged wrongdoing, the alleged, you know, determine whether or not a prohibited personnel practice had occurred. Uh, at the conclusion of the investigation, if we made the determination that a prohibited personnel practice had occurred, we would approach the VA and ask them to take um, appropriate disciplinary action. If they fail to take appropriate disciplinary action, at that point, we would uh, have the ability to file a complaint with the Merit Systems Protection Board and prosecute the case. And then how often would you say VA implements your recommendations and how often do they um, push back? So on discipline, um, they, they implement our recommendations. So we have not, uh, since the, the passage of um, the 2017 uh, Whistleblower Protection Act, we're not aware of any OSC case where OSC might made a final determination uh, that retaliation had occurred, uh, where we requested disciplinary action, and the VA did not ultimately comply with that request. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago, the Inspector General Michael Missile testified that quote incidents in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and Clarksburg, West Virginia, serve as devastating examples of the most catastrophic consequences of disengaged leadership and the dangerous culture that is fostered when leaders are not attentive to and invested in their staff and the veterans they serve, end quote. OEWP's role is to hold these leaders and others accountable. I believe it has failed. We owe it to veterans and VA employees to improve the accountability of and whistleblower protections at the department, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Mann. I'll now recognize Chairman Takano for five minutes. Uh, well, thank you. Uh Chairman Pappas. Uh, let me start with a question for the VA witnesses. As I've said in my opening statement, I do believe that the Secretary, Assistant Secretary Donahue and the General Counsel's Office are trying to move in the right direction and want to protect whistleblowers. But we are simply not where we ought to be. I'm very concerned that those retaliating against whistleblowers are not facing the consequences for their actions. Assistant Secretary Donahue, I'd ask you to comment as to why only one third of your disciplinary action, your disciplinary action recommendations for known retaliators are being implemented. Thank you, um, Chair Takano. Um, the again, the, the tools that have been provided in the statute, including the transparency and the light that is shed on when we make a disciplinary recommendation, why aren't they taking um, or when, or exactly the tools to get to the bottom and answer the question. That They are complex. The work we've done over the last year um, has shown that, for example, um, there, are, there are legitimate and appropriate legal, legal um, reasons for our recommendations through the disciplinary process to change in terms of the Douglas factors, which are legally required by management um, to be applied when deciding discipline. Douglas factors um, are not investigated by OAWP and aren't the kinds of things um, that are typically in within an investigative authority. 
Um, we've also identified things where we need to improve. Um, we've identified that, that there can be a misunderstanding about the whistleblower law. And we have um, taken steps already, both in enhanced training, in enhanced communication and dialogue, in enhanced reports of investigation, to more, to, to even more embed an understanding of not only the whistleblower law, but the really important public policy decisions behind it. Um, we are taking other steps um, from, again, I, I mentioned the import of the first several years of OAWP having difficulties and the ramifications that lasted even after that, um, including um, within the last two years, OAWP getting through like a 500 plus case backlog. That led to timeliness issues. And so that our reports of, of um, investigation were going out years after um, certain actions. All of these things are places where OAWP has already shown significant improvement and we believe more improvement. Um, and again, as we get better and better, um, the tool that's been provided where we're even having, having these conversations um, is new in the federal government and allows us to get to the next level to make the real cultural improvements. Well, I know you're aiming for cultural improvement, um, but I also would hope that you would have a plan or a proposal uh, to deal with the fact that you've only had one third of your disciplinary recommendations, the known retaliators, implemented. Uh, so that would be of great import to me and uh, this committee if you would uh, make sure the department you know, clearly lays out the plan or proposal uh, for uh, for dealing with uh, the implementation of these di these disciplinary action recommendations. Now, Assistant Secretary Donahue, uh, what about the settlement agreements? If the Office of General Counsel does not honor a, settle a settlement agreement, do you have the authority to force adherence? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Takano. Uh, again, we are we are making great strides to use the tools that Congress provided to VA within OAWP to do exactly that. Um, the flow is now in place, um, and we are receiving um, settlement agreements. If I, just, um, if I just interrupt for a moment, I just need to know that you answer my question. Do you have the authority to force adherence to settlement agreements to settlement agreements if the Office of General Counsel does not honor a settlement agreement. So if they're not honoring the agreement, do you have the authority to force uh, adherence to the agreement? Our authority would be to monitor the terms, to ensure that they were complied with, and to provide recommendations to VA if that was not the case. Yeah, but, uh, but do you have the authority uh, vested in you to be able to say, hey, General Counsel, you're not honoring the settlement agreement that was made uh, with the whistleblower, do you do you have the authority to uh, f to force the adherence to happen? We do not. OWP does not have enforcement authority. It's an advisory um, and a recommendation role. That's what I needed to know. I, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll now recognize Jack uh, Representative Jack Bergman for five minutes. I see him online. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll get right to the. Right to the questions right away. Uh, Assistant Secretary Donahue, how often do you meet with the secretary to discuss accountability issues? Um, thank you for that question. I meet monthly with the secretary um, from a standing basis. Um, in addition, uh, as needed thereafter, um, if there were particular issues that, that could pop up during the month. Okay, and I'm gonna assume when you say you meet with the secretary, you meet actually meet with the secretary, not with his designated representative. I actually meet with the secretary. Yeah. Uh, would you care to offer what you think his opinion is of uh, VA's track record of not accepting OAWP's recommendation? How does he think it's going? Uh, that I, I can't speak for the secretary, um, but I can tell you that um, he uh, has charged me and is closely monitoring our work uh, involving recommendations um, and management not taking recommendations and why those reasons may or may not happen um, and has been fully supportive of our efforts in seeking to improve those. 
Okay. And uh, also, uh, over the past five years, <clears throat> the taxpayers have spent basically more than $125 million on OAWP. Um, do you believe that we've gotten a $125 million return on that investment? Uh, thank you for that for that question. Um, and I'm mindful of the last question that you that you had regarding this uh, and appreciated that because it caused me to do some thinking. Um, first, in, in terms of the total, um, I can't speak to the first three years. Um, everybody um, that that has spoken so far and, and me particularly has recognized um, how unfortunate those first three years are. But I believe in the tools in this statute in terms of its ability to, to both improve whistleblower protection um, and to get at the culture of VA. Um, and while that's not a dollar for dollar um, look, I also understand, um, and, and for example, um, agencies um, like the OIG um, start to dig down in terms of monetizing at least um, for some bellwether of um, being good stewards of taxpayer money. Um, and I believe that that's an important improvement that we can begin to make in the OAWP as well. Okay, thanks. Um, by the way, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, how much time do I have remaining on my time? You've got two minutes and 17 seconds. Thank you. Um, Assistant Secretary Donahue, a current law requires that when the secretary does not agree to take action on a recommendation made by OAWP, VA must notify Congress as to why the recommendation has not taken place. I believe that VA is not following the law by batching these notifications and basically sending a lump of cases at, all at once to Congress. In previous hearings, we have asked the department to end this practice and basically immediately send notifications to the committee for full transparency, kind of a, kind of a constant flow. Uh, any uh, comments on why VA has not complied with this pretty simple request? I uh, thank you for the opportunity um, to respond to that question. As I've indicated and hopefully shown, um, my office and I personally am committed to transparency with uh, to Congress. Um, and I, I sincerely believe that periodic and not singular reporting increases that transparency. It also is more efficient use of administrative, um, administrative and agency resources. Um, and the reason is singular notices are not a good bellwether for systemic issues. With that said, we also commit um, and are always available for briefing on singular or particular matters. Mm. So we've committed- Okay, I, 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 I know my time is running out and I would just ask you, if, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I think consider the timing between you know, are you doing it a lump sum with X number? Because that could vary the time frame. And maybe if it was once a week, once a month, not singular, but but think of some regularity to, to, to get energy, consistent energy behind the process. And lastly, um, you mentioned in previous uh, uh, testimony that you were conducting a strategic review of the OAWP procedures and office structure. Uh, has a review been completed? What were the results? What's up? Well, we, we have many reviews of many different OAWP processes in place, but, but my suspicion is because I spoke so much about the um, process by which we are um, um, constantly reviewing why recommendations are taken or not taken, um, that you may be talking about that. Um, and we have. We, we, we've identified um, the various reasons. Um, some of them, as I mentioned, are, are just built into the system, and it, it actually... It would, it would suggest that the system is legally not working if our recommendations were taken at 100%. Now, with that said, I'm not suggesting that, um, that even at some of the figures, although our figures are a little bit different than some that have been mentioned here, um, that, that they're worthy of looking, looking into. We, again, we found misunderstanding of the whistleblower law. We're, we're doing work on that timeliness we are constantly and looking I'm, at I'm guessing thank you i'm guessing my time is getting close if not over and you know continuous process review kind of a lean lean approach to all of this uh, probably works well for everyone with that uh, mr chairman i yield back thank you thank you i'll now recognize representative luria for five minutes uh, thank you and i'd like to direct my questions to ms mitriano 
Um, I'd like to talk about when there's a whistleblower case where the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection, an investigation finds that retaliation has occurred. I understand that even when there is, when it's clear that a whistleblower has experienced retaliation, the details of how to make a whistleblower whole are not ironed out by OAWP. Rather, I understand that the Office of General Counsel negotiates with the whistleblower. Given that the lawyers of the Office of General Counsel are supposed to argue for the best interests of the department, including lowering costs at the VA, what conflicts does this create when providing support and protection to a whistleblower? Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Um, we in the Office of General Counsel believe certainly that we do represent the agency. However, um, we, do, we do not stand in an adversarial mode with our whistleblowers um, a, that bring actions such as this. You know, like like um, the Assistant Secretary, we fully support and respect the courageousness of whistleblowers who come forward in the department. We consider whistleblowers part of the department that we all represent in the Office of General Counsel. So, so our efforts, when whenever it's whether it's the Office of Special Counsel or the Office of um, Accountability and Whistleblower Protection, whenever they bring to our attention that there, uh, there has been retaliation and we engage in settlement negotiations with the employee, our efforts are always designed to arrive at the most suitable settlement agreement for the employee and for the agency. It, again, it's not in an adversarial mode. It's not in that setting that we approach settlement negotiations. It's really in a, a best interest of all um, a, approach that we take. Now, with that said, settlements are two-way streets. Um, it's, it's not um, within the agencies. Uh, power and authority to force a settlement um, upon a whistleblower. Um, it, you know, both both parties have to come voluntarily to agree to the terms, and so that's some of the complexity that we find ourselves dealing with. Is is simply sometimes the, um, uh, I guess, the proposals made by either party in, in the settlement negotiations are sometimes very far apart, and they they require a fair amount of creativity and effort uh, in order to reach something that's mutually agreeable um, to to both the whistleblower and into the agency. Thank you for that. And just a few questions. I've kind of grouped these three questions together because I think you probably talked to them in their totality. So how do you establish a wall between the responsibility of the Office General, of General Counsel to protect the department and arguing in favor of making a whistleblower whole? So, so there seems like there's a, a conflict of interest there. And for example, does your office have guidance on the level of restitution for whistleblower cases? And also, do you assign different lawyers to first argue against the whistleblower when dealing with the Office of Special Counsel and then determining how to provide restitution? I just kind of trying to understand like where the lines are drawn. Is there any guidance that provides separation between those roles that reside in the same office? Again, thank you for the question. We um, we do have a policy in, in the Office of General Counsel that requires every every attorney that's handling a matter to uh, evaluate whether or not there are any conflicts of interest between their representation of the agency in any particular case. And so if, a, if an attorney feels that they cannot provide fair and unbiased representation because they have some sort of a conflict, they're required to consult with their supervisors. Supervisors are also required to monitor to ensure that that's not happening. And so if we do feel that um, in the rare case where there's too much of a conflict because uh, an individual is, is, has been too involved in any aspect of the case, we, we provide a, a, a alternate counsel. We will assign that to an, a different attorney. We're large enough that we have the capacity to do that. But again, it, it rarely occurs because most of the, uh, the, the cases that, that we're discussing here today um, are cases that are in the settlement mode, um, primarily with the Office of Special Counsel involved in facilitating some of these settlement negotiations. They're not in the situation where the, the attorneys are representing um, the agency in an adversarial mode with our whistleblowers. We're, we're truly in a, um, a, a, a situation where we're trying to get to the best negotiated settlement for all parties involved. Thank you. And um, Ms. McMurray, did you have anything additional on that from the Office of Special Counsel? Uh, no, except to state that, uh, you know, one of our primary goals um, at uh, OSC is to help whistleblowers obtain uh, relief as quickly as possible. And we view uh, settlements as playing an important function um, in that goal. Well, thank you both for your information and response and I yield back. Thank you very much. I have uh, a few additional questions here if we can go another round. Uh, they haven't quite called votes yet. 
Um, but um, Assistant Secretary Donaghy, maybe I could turn to you and back to the settlement agreement issue. A year ago, uh, Chairman Takano and I wrote to the Secretary asking about four specific cases that we're still working through the settlement process. Uh, two of these cases uh, had settlement agreements in hand, but VA hadn't enforced them, including ensuring that the whistleblowers continue to have employment as promised and were free from retaliation. I understand only one of these cases has since seen resolution despite, again, years of waiting from the whistleblowers, which underscores the need for better accountability. I don't know if you have comment today about these cases. That certainly would be helpful, but after the hearing, could you provide the committee with, with details on each? Uh Thank you, Chair Pappas. Um, I appreciate the understanding that I can't comment on a specific matter and, in, and particularly involving matters that are in litigation. I can, however, say um, as to, to any specific case um, that they do help us inform improvements to the process, and that includes the processes that we've already put into place um, for settlement agreements um, from OGC to come to OAWP to really look take a good look and review of what it is we can do uh, to increase enforcement um, concerns uh, about specific settlement agreements. And frankly, we've, we, we've um, come a long way and been heartened also by being able to maybe use um, processes that are already in place with the EO process, for example. So we appreciate, um, we appreciate the ability to, um, to continuously improve. Well, thank you for that. Um, so in your written testimony, you talked about uh, asserting that setting forth additional requirements for VA to track the negotiation, implementation, enforcement of settlement agreements would create some legal and practical challenges. Um, you also testified that VA is um, on track to create a tracking tool. Um, so it seems like a little bit of a contradiction for me. Could you comment on the specific problems to our provision in the legislation um, that seems to just um, spell out something that you're already trying to do. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the ability to clarify that. And I apologize for the confusion. So the dichotomy is involves matters that are currently in litigation or administrative review where that process has checks and balances, um, counsel, attorney, client um, provisions that OAWP is deeply respectful of. With that said, um, when a matter is settled, um, therein lies um, the ability for OAWP to, to play a role in improving process, to ensure that um, terms are enforced, to ensure that accountability is dress, addressed. Um, and as always, um, through processes that have been in place since, since OAWP started, um, we are a forum that if there are new allegations that involve the enforcement of whistleblower retaliation, we would be a forum that um, that, that person could come to. Well, let me move on to Ms. Matrano. Uh, we've been, been in touch with a whistleblower who's indicated that an OGC lawyer argued against a certain level of financial restitution due to the lawyer's belief that the whistleblower may have broken some rule while employed. If true, I find that kind of odd. My understanding is that the financial restitution is based on damages caused by retaliation, not whether OGC determines a transgression has been committed by the whistleblower. So um, can you talk a little bit more about guidelines for financial restitution? Um, and is there anything that you can provide to the committee that spells that out? Thank you. Yeah, yes, um, generally we're, we're, the guidelines that we use when we're in any type of a settlement negotiation is um, the, the general premise that we cannot award in settlement anything more than a court could award in damages if the case actually went fully to hearing. So that's kind of the outside bounds of, of our uh, authority when it comes to, I guess, defending or, or not defending is maybe not, not the right word, but respecting the government fisc. So, so that's the, the premise that we operate under. It's a make whole premise. And I think it's the same premise that OSC operates under as, as, as they're approaching corrective action. So, you know, but within that, I, I, I certainly, of course, can't comment on the, the, the case that you mentioned. I don't have enough information about it, but um, there are, you know, a number of factors that go into trying to arrive at that best solution uh, for an employee. And sometimes creative solutions are, are required as well. Again, seeking the best possible remedy for the whistleblower in those cases where the agency believes there has been some retaliation. Okay, but just to follow up, do you have written guidelines? Um, and is that something you can provide to this committee? 
I, I think we, we generally follow, um, to the extent they're, they're not really written guidelines, sir. I, we, we follow um, precedent that's been established by various administrative forums on, um, I guess, the scope of settlement agreements. So there's, and, and we also follow the, the precedent set in adjudications at the Merit Systems Protection Board, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, you know, previous cases where, where there have been um, engagements with OSC. And so there's no specific document that, that exists uh, that someone could follow? No, not not in that regard. It, it's, it requires legal analysis, I think, of, of the available you know body of, of law that's available. Okay. Well, my time is up. Uh, Ranking Member Mann, I'll turn to you for five minutes. Great. Uh, thank you, Chairman Pappas. Assistant Secretary Donahue, your written testimony states, quote, the potential for duplication is mitigated by collaborative work between OAWP and OSC to avoid overlapping investigations, end quote. Would you please elaborate on this collaborative work between OAWP and OSC? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Mann. Um, yes, recognizing that duplication um, is something that, that we want to um, not only avoid for efficiency of, of resources, but not to have duplicative um, processes going on, we mitigate this both by policy and communication. So we have a policy that if we know that a whistleblower is pursuing um, with OSC, we defer to that process. Um, and allow that to move forward. Um, and if there is something when that process is in for OAWP to attend to, we can do that. But we defer to the choice of the whistleblower. Um, as well, uh, we have coordination um, ongoing, regular, uh, my staff and the, the staff with OSC um, to discuss this coordination and to ensure that we are, are aligned. I, I will note that there are times um, where whistleblowers respectively for each office um, request confidentiality. And so that duplication, when confidentiality by those respective um, individuals, both by law and, and frankly, by respect to the whistleblower, um, may result in duplication. Okay. But that actually is deference to uh, the request of a whistleblower. Th thank you. Uh, question for Ms. McBury. How closely does OSC collaborate with OAWP? So thank you for the question. To be clear, OSC does not collaborate with OAWP at all on the investigative piece. I believe what the assess assistant secretary is referring to is our collaboration on general training, our collaboration on best practices, but with respect to actual individual cases, uh, OSC does its own investigation. We do not share our investigative findings or our investigative files uh, with OAWP, nor do we uh, tell OAWP that we even have the case unless we're in a situation where we are seeking um, a stay of the personnel action involved and uh, Section 714 uh, is triggered. As Ms. McSworthy, what percent of your workload would you say is VA related? So on for the agency as a whole, the VA you know, represents roughly, we can get you the exact statistics, but it, it's been consistently roughly a third of our docket on both the prohibited personnel practice side and the uh, disclosure side for a, a number of years. Um, and again, it might be a percentage point higher one year, percentage point right. lower another year, but approximately one third. Okay. And then Ms. McBurr, last question. Do you believe OSC would see a substantial increase in workload if OAWP were to refer all whistleblowers to OSC? So we don't have any data to suggest that. Um, we have been an option for VA whistleblowers um, prior to the existence of OAWP. Uh, and we, when OAWP uh, came into existence, we did not see a decrease in our VA caseload. Again, it's been a steady one third uh, for a number of years, really dating back to the, the 2014 wait list. Um, incident that Chairman Pappas referenced at the beginning um, of the hearing. So we don't have any reason to believe uh, that a change, the proposed legislation would impact our dockets. Okay. That, that's my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Mann. I don't see any further questions from any of the uh, committee members who are here. Uh, we've got votes that have been called, um, and I just want to thank our government witnesses for appearing, for answering our questions. Uh, we want to stay in close contact with you as um, the legislative process moves forward, 
and I'll just reiterate, we are uh, continue to be interested in any sort of technical assistance or feedback that you can provide for our efforts. Um, so thank you very much uh, for participating in today's subcommittee hearing. Um, we'll close the first panel and the subcommittee stands in recess uh, to the conclusion of votes here and then we'll open the second panel.
Hi, this is Zoom. Can you hear me in the room? We can't hear anything coming from 210. Yes, can you hear us? We can hear you just fine. HRS production is muted. I think you need to unmute that before we can move forward. Can we get a sound test from the room, please? Test one, two, three. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, are you ready to resume the yes. hearing? Yes. Uh, please provide a five second countdown. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. All right, I call the subcommittee back to order and I wanna thank our witnesses who are here for the second panel. Uh, we have virtually joining us Ms. Jacqueline Garrick, founder of Whistleblowers of America. Welcome. We also have Mr. Tom Devine, legal director for the Government Accountability Project. Welcome. And Ms. Joanna Derman, policy analyst for the Project on Government Oversight. Thank you for joining us. Um, for Ms. Garrick, please just pause a couple of seconds before speaking so that we capture all of your words. And everyone's written statements in full will be uh, included in the hearing record without objection. So with that, I'll recognize Ms. Garrick for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman and the honorable members of this subcommittee. Thank you for inviting Whistleblowers of America to submit our views on the bipartisan discussion draft to make improvements to the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection. We commend you and endorse this legislation. We believe Section 2 is needed to restructure and reset the independence of the office. It is still subjugated to general counsel, which is a conflict of interest. We fully endorse Section 3. VA should not investigate itself. There are multiple points of failure because the fox is guarding the hen house. Let's review. OIG substantiated the ethics violations by former Education Director Charmaine Bogue that I initially raised but was ignored. She left the A after refusing to cooperate. There is no accountability for this. So no senior leader in her chain has faced consequences. With its new subpoena authority, WOA and Empower have written to the OIG to continue its investigation, which this committee has received copies of those letters. It should also investigate the 450 million CARES Act funded GI Bill IT contract she awarded and demand scrutiny over contracts that invo involve former sanctioned BBA executives. These revolving door relationships go unchecked. Meanwhile, whistleblowers have no due process recourse to remove retaliatory reports, which we hope can be addressed by section four. This lack of accountability is not uncommon. Although VA has a zero tolerance policy on sexual harassment, a class action settled for 1.3 million, but the people responsible are still employed. In the book, Behind the Murder Curtain, Sackman writes, hospital managers have a well-documented history of defending employees suspected of intentionally harming patients. They are afraid of bad publicity and potential lawsuits. They sweep problems under the rug while hundreds of veterans have died at the hands of medical serial killers. VA police officers confirm similar observations. Unlike other federal officers who report to justice, they work for the VA director. So these officers are told to drop investigations involving theft, fraud, homicide, suicide, and overdoses like with Dr. Belinsky. VA is invested in protecting its reputation and avoiding blame. It gives itself Chevron deference as the expert so it can rule in its own favor. WA supports section four. We have requested that VA use OSHA retaliation policy and identify conditions and adverse events, which include falsely accusing employees of poor performance, which is a violation of USC 18 and a lack of candor according to MSPB. Cyberbullying and doxing is also a retaliatory tactic because it causes damages to reputations and humiliates. These tactics cause emotional pain and suffering that VA recognizes in its research and programs while denying its own employees the same conditions for ports should be provided by other entities. VA should practice what it preaches. 
The National Center for PTSD has extensive research on emotional abuse and traumatic impacts. Studies show it can lead to depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and suicidal ideation. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among working aged adults, and veterans working for the VA are at risk. According to OSHA, damages may be awarded for emotional distress, pain and suffering, loss of re reputation, and humiliation. OAWP should retain its ability to impose temporary relief while OSC investigates because of these hardships. We fully endorse Section 5 on settlement agreements. VA employees, as you saw, can wait one to five years. VA knows to, it's, it's known to miss mediation deadlines and not show up for arbitrations, which, which cost employees wasted time. This is not equal access to justice. There are no repercussions because there are no standards for settlements and no accurate database. VA does not have to report the time it takes to settle, resources, or its formula. VA decides settlement based upon its own internal risk model, but that data is not available to the employee. So there is no forcing function for these settlements. Um, and VA has not reported fines to the judgment fund under the No Fear Act. We support section six and believe OSHA and OSC training should inform VA. We endorse section seven and are looking forward to seeing the metrics that can shine the light on how the government is spending its money in these cases and how it can inform research. So we thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the many VA employees like Jeff and Minyu you mentioned earlier, who did the right thing but suffered the consequences. We are grateful to them and this committee for recognizing their plight. Thank you very much, Ms. Garrick. Now I'll turn to Mr. Devine. I'll recognize you for five minutes. Thank you for this bipartisan legislation, which we believe is the beachhead for significant reform at the agency with the government's worst track record of whistleblower retaliation. Um, first, it matters to give credit where it's due. When I've testified previously, OAWP itself was producing a plurality of GAP's VA whistleblower retaliation complaints. Um, since Ms. Donahue, Donahue became OAW's chief, there have not even been any new requests for OAWP reprisal clients. She's met personally with those uh, who had pending complaints so that they felt heard, and she's conscientiously worked to resolve all but one of the cases which we had and she had inherited. Um, introducing civility and empathy at OAWP is a uh, leadership team. It's a welcome breakthrough and frankly a relief. Um, unfortunately, good vibes are no substitute for a credible track record uh, or for structural reforms, which is why your legislation is so welcome. Uh, our comments. Section 2 creates OAWP Council, which is the badly needed cornerstone for structural reform. The Office of General Counsel uh, cannot avoid uh, having an inherent conflict of interest. Um, we echo whistleblowers of America's concerns, however, whether the infrastructure will be sufficient. Um, and so we think that um, all the legislative history should pin down that first, OAWP's counsel uh, performance appraisal will be prepared by uh, OAWP's chief, not the OGC. Second, that OAWP counsel have final decision-making authority for recommendations on OAWP issues. And third, that OAWP counsel will have authority to prepare independent legal opinions on OAWP matters without prior OGC review or approval. Um, the Section 3 transfers reprisal investigative authority from OAWP to the Office of Special Counsel. And we fully support this reassignment to an agency with structural independence when, um, that has four decades more experience and accumulated expertise. Um, no internal agency without uh, independence or enforcement authority has ever been able to effectively protect whistleblowers. The most they can do is ask the parent agency to change its mind. Um, however, as a technical matter, it's important that um, this transfer of authority does not create second-class OSC complainants. Um, there needs to be provisions so that if OSC doesn't help them, uh, they can have the same parity as all other complainants um, and be entitled to go to the Merit Systems Protection Board for an individual right of action administrative hearing. 
Um, section 4 expands retaliatory um, protections um, to outlaw retaliatory referrals to licensing boards, which is very important because agencies often bypass civil service remedies with this tactic, and that can lock in blacklisting and permanent exile from the profession. Um, however, as a technical matter, again, the legislation has to uh, be structured so that the OSC doesn't help the people. They will still have due process rights. Um, um, this applies not only to licensing referrals, but currently existing provisions for retaliatory investigations or peer reviews. Um, um, uh, in my experience, um, OSC has never pursued formally corrective action for these types of lower level uh, harassment. They reserve their energy for terminations. And uh, unless we make this technical fix, these new rights could be a mirage in reality. Um, uh, uh, Section 4B provides a more realistic legal burden of proof um, for temporary relief than currently available. In my written testimony, has made some technical suggestions for fine tuning. But this is one area where we think um, OEW's track record is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, right now, OEWP has authority to order temporary relief whenever they open an investigation. Um, if this gets transferred to OSC, um, the whistleblowers will have to wait until OSC completes its um, initial fact finding. And that can be a very lengthy process, which will create delays and needed temporary relief. Um, we think OSC, sh OAWP, should retain its current authority. Um, we absolutely support the protection for SES employees, which um, uh, often are the source of the most significant whistleblowing disclosures. And we think the provisions in Section 5 and 7 are just outstanding um, for uh, creating a comprehensive tracking system of the statute's results and compliance with settlement agreements and disciplinary recommendations. Um, it's the foundation for OEWP's mission. Um, uh, we support the uh, provisions for training and are concerned, however, that some existing authorities that OEWP has uh, may not be mandated by statute any longer. Uh, receiving anonymous disclosures, uh, providing counseling in ADR. We were encouraged by Ms. Donahue's testimony that they're doing this voluntarily, but should be part of the structure. Thank you for this opportunity, and we're on call to do any contributions which will help make this outstanding initiative get enacted into law. Thank you very much, Mr. Devine. Ms. Derman, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Pappas, Ranking Member Mann, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify about draft legislation to strengthen oversight and accountability at the Department of Veterans Affairs. <clears throat> POGO is proud to endorse this bipartisan legislation under consideration today. We believe it is a strong bill that would help ensure VA whistleblowers feel safe coming forward to disclose by misconduct. It would do this by strengthening the independence of the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection, OAWP. Specifically, it would establish an OAWP legal counsel and refocus the work of the office. As an organization, POGO has a history of working to protect whistleblowers at the VA that predates the creation of OAWP. Following the 2014 waitlist scandal, we coordinated with veterans groups to invite whistleblowers to speak to us about the misconduct they witnessed at the VA. The response was staggering. Never before in our decades-long history as an organization have we received more disclosures of misconduct. In little over a month, we heard from approximately 800 current and former VA employees and veterans spread out across 35 states as well as the District of Columbia. It was clear that misconduct in the VA was an endemic problem and that VA whistleblowers were terrified of retaliation. Established in 2017 to address these challenges, OAWP's mandate is to receive, investigate, or refer all matters involving allegations of senior leader misconduct, poor performance, and whistleblower retaliation. While this was a laudable effort, OAWP unfortunately failed to function as it was intended. A 2019 VA Inspector General report stated that OAWP suffered from significant deficiencies and floundered in its mission to protect whistleblowers. POGO testified before this and other congressional committees multiple times to share our perspective on OAWP's progress. We warned that unless OAWP was sufficiently independent from the VA Office of General Counsel, 
it would unintentionally undermine its duty to whistleblowers. Currently, after OAWP develops disciplinary recommendations, it sends them over to the VA General Counsel's Office for legal review and analysis before they are finalized. This means that the VA General Counsel has ample opportunity to reject an OAWP recommendation for disciplinary action. Even though OAWP and the VA General Counsel are both components of the VA, their interests and priorities vary greatly when it comes to accountability. Department attorneys often believe that their primary responsibility is to protect the interests and public perception of the department. In contrast, OAWP's primary duty is to conduct objective fact-based analysis instead of ensuring that the agency stays out of legal trouble. The draft bill before this committee's consideration today is an answer to this structural weakness. First, it would establish an OAWP specific legal counsel so that OAWP does not have to rely on the VA General Counsel for legal advice, which I will say is the same construction as federal offices of inspectors general. Second, the bill refocuses the work of the office by removing OAWP's investigative functions. This would free up OAWP resources to be able to issue reports, analyze data, and identify trends within the agency. It would also allow OAWP to take on a more educational role and work to promote a culture where whistleblowers are seen as heroes rather than villains. Lastly, the bill strengthens whistleblower protections, requires OAWP to track whistleblower settlement agreements, and directs OAWP to provide spe special training to VA employees on whistleblower rights. Additionally, it enhances VA reporting requirements on whistleblower disclosures. While POGO believes this is a strong bill as written, we also encourage the subcommittee to consider the technical fixes offered by my co-panelists who lead organizations that represent whistleblowers directly. As I close, I want to stress that VA whistleblowers play a key role in exposing instances of fraud, waste, and abuse in the department. Yet they frequently faced retaliation for their disclosures, while senior agency leaders face almost no accountability for their actions. As such, we support this bipartisan legislation to reform OAWP and better serve veterans in need. Hmm. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Derman, and thank you to all members of our second panel here for your comments, and I thought um, your presentations today were very thorough, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity hmm. to continue to connect with you as we move this legislation hmm. forward. Now, we'll uh, turn to the question portion of today's panel, and I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, I think most of you were here um, or were able to hear uh, the first panel, and I'm just wondering if I can get your reactions to what you heard from uh, the VA witnesses and Office of Special Counsel witness on the first panel, and maybe, uh, Ms. Garrick, I can turn to you. Do you have any thoughts based on what you heard uh, this morning? Yeah, so I, first of all, I would like to echo what Tom Devine said. We have definitely appreciated the new spirit and the culture that um, huh. the Secretary Donna is trying to create. However, I do not think that hiring more attorneys is the same as having actual investigators. So I, I think we're still seeing that issue as problematic. And I think that their definition of retaliation needs to be more psychosocial based and understand the trauma informed perspective. And I would encourage her to get together with OSHA and have a conversation about how OSHA looks at um, retaliation and what it really is and the implications that it can have. Thank you. Mr. Devine, any reflections? You want to just turn your mic on, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I empathize with Ms. Donahue having to speak on behalf of a department whose track record is indefensible. Um, uh, with respect to the Office of Special Counsel's responses, um, Ms. McMurray's answered that um, uh, the agency has not rejected any of their disciplinary recommendations. Needs a little bit more context. Um, in our experience with a lot of VA clients, the OSC hasn't made any disciplinary recommendations. And I bring this up to just to kind of highlight um, the, the point that um, our expectations aren't realistic if we expect 
um, that the problems will be solved merely by transferring uh, investigative authority from OEWP to the Office of Special Counsel. Um, I respect that agency a lot, but they reserve their resources for terminations. Um, their SOP is if they don't settle a case, and they get more deference than OEWP, but if they don't settle a case, uh, they don't fight. Um, uh, they close the case if they're not able to settle it voluntarily. And this means that um, if it's OSC or nothing for the VA whistleblowers, um, very, very frequently it's going to be nothing unless they have the opportunity to defend themselves through due process. And that's the reason for the technical recommendations. Um, OSC, it's not realistic for them to do more than make a point occasionally in high profile cases or to get voluntary settlements. Um, if people are going to defend themselves against bread and butter retaliation and harassment, they need due process and the right to defend themselves. Thank you. Ms. Derman. Uh, I did have the opportunity to see the first panel speak, and I'll say that it was uh, disappointing but not surprising to see the VA oppose broadly this bill. Um, I think we saw no evidence to suggest that OAWP is able to fulfill its critical mission right now. Uh, and frankly, I think that it raises serious questions when we hear the Assistant Secretary of OAWP seem to imply that there would be a problem or a cause of concern if the department were to not implement 100% of OAWP's recommendations. Um, that really gets at the heart of what POGO is concerned about, which is OAWP's lack of independence. Uh, and that's why we are so supportive of this draft legislation before the subcommittee today. Um, we're very encouraged to see that it uh, would establish an OAWP legal counsel and it would eliminate OAWP's current investigative authorities. Thank you. Ms. Garrick, maybe I'll turn to you next. Um, in your written statement, you note that OAWP is failing to meaningfully hold senior VA leadership accountable and you cite OAWP's lack of independence. Um, can you elaborate on the conflict you see between OAWP and the Office of General Counsel as it's currently organized? Sure. So as I think we've been discussing, OAWP goes to the General Counsel for these decisions. That is a conflict because the agency is protecting itself. It's not protecting the whistleblower or the employee or even the veteran at the end of the day who this is all about. I mean, I, I'm a veteran. I use the VA. I want to see it be the best possible agency it can be. And when we hear these things and we see these things and they're not taken seriously, then there is definitely cause for concern. We had a former OAWP director that this committee himself sanctioned, the OIG sanctioned, and now he's back on contracts. How is that accountability? We've seen too many of this revolving door. We brought to the attention of OAWP the situation with Charmaine Bogue two years ago, and nobody has responded to that. It took the OIG, it took Senator Grassley to do anything about those conditions. Well, thank you. My time's up. Uh, Ranking Member Mann. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, to all three of you for staying on through our delay and uh, for the testimony um, for your willingness to be here today. Uh, a few questions. You know, Earlier I referenced five reports that I believe VA failed to protect whistleblowers and hold <laughs> senior leaders accountable. Do you agree that these cases are indicative of the problems we are all trying to address with this discussion draft? And uh, Ms. Garrick, I'll ask you to start. Sure, so I mean, I, I, I maybe we're not talking about the exact same cases, but I think in my testimony, I use several examples from VA police officers who you would think know a lot about how to conduct an investigation. But because they come under the authority of the medical center directors and not uh, DOJ, they're told to drop cases, cover up, ignore, don't arrest. I, it, it, they've got their hands tied. So when you're doing things like that, of course there's no accountability. And that's the thread I think we need to pull here is that when we see senior executives engaging in corruption, like the Bo case, when we see contracts like the LaFont Award, to a former um, SES who was investigated and suspended. How are we possibly to believe that these things are being done and being done properly? It doesn't surprise me that only five cases have been investigated because I've got dozens and dozens of VA employees that come to us 
that have not gotten any justice or they're still fighting. It takes years. So this goes on and on. And so I do appreciate what uh, this committee is trying to do with this in um, legislation. And I am hopeful that we will see some changes in the future. Great. Uh, you know, next question for, for the whole panel. What is your view of the quality of investigation conducted by OSC um, compared to that of OAWP? So if I can jump in on this one. So this is where I have been um, talking to these police officers and I would definitely um, recommend the book Behind the Murder Curtain written by OIG Special Agent Retired Bruce Sackman who talks exactly about the lack of their ability to collect evidence, communicate and follow through on these cases. Um, he can give you a very well documented examples of how these things don't work and what is needed in order to make them work. Anything else to add? Yes, uh, we, we've we um, worked with OSC and OAWP, and um, OS, the primary difference is OSC communicates with the whistleblowers and gets evidence from them. Uh, in OAWP, in numerous cases that we've been exposed to, there wasn't any communications. There was um, rapidly shifting change of uh, investigators. Um, uh, it might as well have been filing a complaint with the Wizard of Oz. Um, uh, uh, one, one agency seems to conduct professional investigations. Um, the other is uh, a fish out of water. As a Kansan, I understood that analogy, so thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if I could, I would also add that uh, Pogo also believes that OSC as an entity is much better equipped to handle cases of whistleblower retaliation. Um, number one, it is an independent agency and so it doesn't face the same kind of conflicts of interest that OAWP currently does vis-a-vis -vis the department. Um, but secondly, uh, it has an enforcement mechanism available to it through the Merit Systems Protection Board. And so if whistleblowers decide to pursue litigation in the case, if their um, uh, whistleblower claims are not being, recommendations for claims are not being implemented by the department, then they can seek to uh, pursue that recourse. Okay. Uh, last question for everybody, but I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Devine. So again, this is for the whole panel, though. Uh, one of the biggest underlying questions that I have about the work of OAB that OAP, OAWP does is that while we know that 80% of OAWP decisions are ignored or changed, we don't know why. Is it because, in your view, OAWP's investigations are flawed, or is it a lack of will by senior VA leaders to pu push for full accountability? Um, I think, Congressman, the, the answer is this is consistent um, agency perspective uh, as almost every organization in um, every other institution in the history of organized uh, uh, entities. Um, uh, organizations tend to react to whistleblowers the way animals do to um, a threats. It's like almost like the institutional equivalent of an animal instinct. If they're threatened, they want to destroy the threat. They don't stop to think, well, maybe we had it coming and there's a lesson to be learned from this and we should be rethinking our approach. They want to destroy the threat. Um, and that's never going to change, and that's why we need to have uh, effective protections that don't just rely on investigations and consensus, but um, also have the element of due process so that people have their day in court to defend themselves. Yeah, I know I'm out of time. I think, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, go, go, go ahead, uh, Ms. Garrett. Well, and I think um, Secretary Donnelly said it herself. She said they have an advisory and a recommendation role. They don't have an enforcement role. So how could they have any teeth in making any of these investigations or any of their decisions um, stick? They don't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I see my time's expired. With that, I yield back. Well, thank you. I'll recognize myself for another five minutes. Um, Ms. Garrick, I'll turn to you. In your written testimony, you indicated that VA should develop a tool or guidance that recommends certain levels of financial restitution in case where cases where retaliation occurred. Um, can you share with me why you believe that this is, is important? And I don't know if you heard the conversation that I had um, with uh, Assistant Secretary Donaghy about this issue and VA, uh, but if you could reflect on that as well. Sure, no, I appreciate that. So I think this is where this imbalance of justice comes from. You've got the VA in control of their policies, their recommendations. They know what their, their formula is for how they're gonna settle these cases. 
the employee who goes in there goes in there blind, especially if they cannot afford an attorney. I mean, we could talk about the hundreds of thousands of dollars. This would be out of pocket for somebody who could take a case over five years if they were doing that by themselves, if they had to pay for it. Most of these employees start out pro se or they start out with attorneys and then can't go through all that. So who does all the research on judgments uh, that we're talking about these legal precedents earlier? Do you really think an employee who is a nurse understands what legal precedent she should cite in asking for a settlement? I mean, that's ridiculous. Those kinds of things should be transparent. They should be assisted. I, I, I've said this before, just like you do with other um, veterans benefits, there should be a duty to assist the claimant. The secretary has a duty to assist the claimant. In the law, it doesn't say anything about what type of claim. So I go back to that, this duty to assist them understanding what their options are for settlement, what's reasonable, what does the law allow, that should be put forth and openly discussed. And I don't think there's any um, transparency or any bar that would keep them from explaining what settlement agreements could look like and what they could be entitled to. And I think that would make this at least a little more fair and it wouldn't put the um, the employee at a disadvantage. The same goes for their legal fees. The, um, the employee has no idea how they're gonna recoup their legal fees and under what guidance does VA agree to that or not agree to that while they spend unknown hundreds of thousands of dollars paying attorneys, HR managers, witnesses, legal um, aid. There's all kinds of things that go unaccounted for when VA is negotiating a settlement that the employee has no idea about. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Devine, if I can turn to you, you talked a little bit about uh, the commitment of the Assistant Secretary and OAWP to uh, protecting whistleblowers. And I'm wondering, how can they better communicate the message about the value of whistleblowers um, and ensure that uh, these folks feel protected? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I think they can communicate it more effectively through results. Uh, and um, the results that they're going to get are not realistically going to be reversing retaliation. The results they can get are in terms of service. Um, they can provide effective uh, counseling and advice to whistleblowers. They can provide effective resources. Uh, they can make recommendations on policies that um, um, the agency should be held to. Uh, for um, uh, 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 throughout this process, um, OAWP has the potential to be an outstanding service agency and resource agency, uh, and it's badly, badly needed for all the reasons that Jackie just summarized. Um, and I would make a PS to, to her answer that um, the issue of attorney fees is another reason why we need to have a jurisdictional grounding in the Whistleblower Protection Act. Mm -hmm. um, that statute provides attorney's fees when you get substantial relief. If we just transfer uh, a prohibition on certain forms of harassment for OSC investigation and don't give it that jurisdictional hook, uh, then there won't be any entitlement to attorney fees when uh, a whistleblower does prevail. And Ms. Derman, thoughts on how VA can rebuild trust with whistleblowers uh, and ensure that they're communicating the value of whistleblowers? Uh, I'll echo um, Tom's statements that I think um, they can signal that through results, and that's why this bipartisan legislation is so strong. I think a, a key part of that is ensuring that OAWP is sufficiently independent from the department. Um, I also would like to draw your attention to um, the, the provision within this bill that would track and monitor settlement agreements. Um, we are aware that this has been a huge problem, not only within the VA, but the federal government at large. Um, Settlement agreements can go on for, for months, if not years. They can be dragged out long and very arduous, uh, not to mention costly for whistleblowers. Um, and so what that means is that um, potential whistleblowers who are thinking of perhaps disclosing instances of fraud, waste, and abuse will see how long and arduous that process is, and it'll then act as a deterrent for them to come forward. So we think it's very important to start to uh, jumpstart the process of really tracking and monitoring what the VA is doing with respect to um, settlement agreements, not to mention um, strengthening the independence of OAWP. Thank you for those comments. 
Ranking Member Mann, would you like to ask any additional questions? Uh, you know, I have no further questions, but Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. Thanks for your partnership on this legislation and look forward to seeing it moving forward. Well, thank you. And I want to thank our witnesses for bearing with us today and joining us. I think your comments were really constructive and I appreciate the technical assistance that you've been providing to us along the way. And we hope to stay in touch as we move forward. I think it was encouraging to, to hear from you all and, and from uh, VA witnesses today about the department's commitment uh, to both listening and protecting whistleblowers. Um, and we know that there's more work to do. Um, changes in leadership can often reverse progress that's been made. That's why this legislation is needed. Um, and we need to ensure that promises made to whistleblowers are kept and not just now, but certainly uh, for years to come. So thank you to all of our witnesses for their contributions. We'll com consider your testimony uh, very closely and other suggestions as we finalize legislation. So all members will have five legislative days to revise and extend any remarks and, ex and include extraneous material. And the hearing is now adjourned.